To begin our day, please welcome my colleague, Dr. Tanji Reed Marshall, who serves as the Education Trust Director of P12 Practice, leading Ed Trust Equity and Motion Assignment Analysis work. Here's a bit more about Dr. Reed Marshall. Prior to joining Ed Trust, Tanji worked in the Office of Academic Programs at Virginia Polytech Institute at State University. Her career also includes elementary and middle school classroom teaching in North Carolina and New Jersey, which has allowed her, which has allowed her opportunities to consult with school districts across the country to refine and focus teacher practice on literacy and to strengthen student achievement with an emphasis on traditionally underserved students. Tanji holds a doctorate in curriculum and instruction with an emphasis on teacher practice with high achieving African American students from Virginia Tech, a master's degree in English education with a focus on critical literacy from the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, and a bachelor's degree in psychology from Boston College. That's a very impressive Resume Tanji. <laughs> Please welcome Dr. Tanji Reed Marshall as she leads us through a comprehensive understanding of parent advocacy and the Emerging Parent Advocacy Bills Act. Good morning, everyone. Can y'all hear me? All right, good. Well, it is Friday, it is a fantastic Friday, and I hope everyone had a great last few days. We're gonna spend some time this morning really digging in and talking a lot about this idea of parent advocacy. Um, thank you, Sergio, for that warm welcome, and I, every time I hear people read information about me, I start looking around going, who's that? Who are they talking about? <laughs> and I was like, wow, I did that, okay. Uh, <laughs> so hashtag go Eagles last night we had one of our Boston College um, graduates get drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles yay go Eagles one thing that's not on that is that I'm an avid Alabama football fan go roll tide hello big roll tide big Al <laughs> so they had <laughs> the Ohio State thank you Eric where are you there he is, Eric's back there, the Ohio State. Two, two, and two last night, Ohio, Alabama, and Georgia in the top 25, so very exciting, yes. All right, so enough of that. Let's start, I will go on and on and on about football, and that's not our purpose this morning. So let's start talking about parent advocacy. I believe that there is a uh, image up there for you to see. When you see those images, Go forward. Go again. There I go. All right. So what you're seeing are images of parent advocacy. We're going to talk about what advocacy looks like because when we say the word advocacy, it has meaning in multiple places. So what you see is parent advocacy. That's also parent advocacy. Thank you, Karen. Karen and I did this like in the last 38 seconds. So I don't know what you see because I can't see them. So, huh? Oh, it's a word cloud? What else, what else do you see? That's it? How about now? Okay. Is it a movie? Oh. Okay, there I went. How about now? All right, we're getting somewhere. I love technology until I don't. <laughs> so, these images are about what it means to be a parent advocate. So here's another image. Did it work? Did it change? All right, the inclusion evolution. So as parent advocacy has changed, it used to be this work of getting parents to raise lots of money for kids, right? Bake sale, anybody, did you ever do that? Anybody ever sell like holiday wrapping? Anybody do the Katie Dids? Where are my Katie Did people? I'm old, so I did Katie Dids. Anybody else do cookies? Cookie dough. Anybody do mattresses? <laughs> Last, two more, two more. How about fruit? And lastly, what about plants? So that has been the work 
of parent advocacy in the traditional sense. We get out there, we sell a bunch of stuff, our kids can do a bunch of stuff, right? But what we've begun to notice is a very critical shift in the ways in which parent involvement via this terminology of advocacy is meant to go forth. So Karen and I, as we always do when we're talking, engage in high-level conversations and really try and move things forward. So here's another image. What else are you seeing? Uh -oh. Am I done? <sighs> okay. I can't tell. Go back. I want to know if you saw them all. Did you see them all, Karen? Okay, state rights one. Okay. Because we pulled this together, that's what I'm asking, because we literally pulled this together this morning at 8.42. <laughs> so that's why I'm asking Karen. But when we think about parent advocacy, we look at this report by Future Ed, and they really began to help us make some meaning about what it was about parent advocacy. And they found two major dual changes, one in technology and one through COVID. And they found more political parent groups via, for, for example, the Oakland Reach, Moms of Liberty, and the National Parents Unions. They found 80 bills already coming through state legislation in 26 states. So we're seeing a lot of activism in ways that are not necessarily advocating for the inclusion of all students to benefit from a public education because all of our tax dollars go to fund public education. And so we're seeing these actions take place that are not as inclusive as they should be. Not as inclusive as you as advocates understand advocacy to mean and understand advocacy to lead to. The other thing they're finding is that there's an over arching and overreaching attack on what has been called anti-critical race theory. I actually say critical race theory instead of using the acronym CRT so that I can avoid the conflation between critical race theory and culturally responsive teaching. Because that's really important. Because we want educators to be as finely in tune to the students in front of them so they can deliver the kind of instruction that deeply engages them. What we're seeing though is parent groups that I've mentioned actively engaging in the kind of work that takes us away from the kinds of involvement that leads to critical action for all students. So today, I'm going to be joined, we are joined, by some experts who do this critical work in the field. Sitting next to me is Morgan Craven from IDRA. Next to her is Michael Cook, a parent from Plano, Texas. Next to him is Letitia Vincent from PAVE here in DC. And next to her is Kamaya Burrell from um, Employment Ed, right? Empower. Empower Ed, I'm sorry, Empower Ed in Tennessee, our student advocate. So we're gonna engage in a conversation, much like you saw yesterday, to really unpack what we see is going on in the education realm regarding parent advocacy. So here's our first question. Why is it important to inform and engage with parents with all different backgrounds and perspectives around equity? I'm gonna ask each of you start out and then we'll come back. So Morgan, begin. Why is that important? Um, I think it's important for parents, and I'll say families. At IDRA, we talk about family engagement because parenting uh, a young person, as you all know, can look like a lot of different things. So we talk about authentic family engagement and the role that families must play in policy and practice and ensuring equitable policy and practice in their schools. And why that is important is because it takes the entire community to fully understand what is going on with students, what is going on with young people, and make sure that schools are being responsive to it. And I think the strongest, and I, I think this is supported by both research and common sense, 
um, the strongest situations that we have in schools that truly support young people involve families, involve families in authentic, w authentic ways. I actually love the way you started because we often say it's not about um, selling cookies or asking parents to occasionally show up at a meeting, but building those strategic relationships that are based on real involvement in what is happening in the school to make sure schools are responsive to community and student needs and to make sure that families feel like they understand what's going on in, in schools and are part of influencing what that looks like. Michael, as you answer the same question, I want you to put your parent hat on and really think about, and, and thinking through what you're about to do because you're running for a, a position on the school board. And so in, in thinking about yourself as a parent, right, um, how do families feel included? Um, you know, the biggest way I think families can feel included is for uh, the system to really work for them. I think one of the challenges that we have as parents is that you know, we send our kids to school and we go to work. And then in order for us to engage in the school, we would have to either take off work or we would have to uh, have flexible work hours uh, or we would have to uh, do something that is, you know, significantly different than our daily life. And I think um, the, the challenge, I think, with the current system is the people that are able to do that um, are then able to have an outsized voice in the outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it becomes uh, not equitable very quickly. Um, and so uh, the, the challenge, I think, uh, as parents, uh, and really as, as, as how we think about having equitable outcomes for parents, is really how to figure out uh, how to get parents engaged in a way that enables them to not put an undue burden on teachers and administrators, but at the same time also um, provides um, a space or a time where you can get a more fuller engagement from the broader community. Mm -hmm. And Letitia, as you uh, build upon Michael's answer, can you talk to us about what is it like to see families that may not represent your perspectives? So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so often in DC, it, it's a very diverse city. It's becoming even more diverse in, in education. Like he just mentioned, you can see certain voices stand up and be present a little bit more so than others. And it has a lot to do with access and equity and, and information and, and resources and means to even be available to participate in a lot of the things that are going on in terms of strategy and decisions as it relates to education, how we choose to uh, provide these resources to people across the city or across the country. and. Oftentimes, when we go to the Wilson Building, when we go to meetings like Learn 24, um, who are over our OST or out of school time funding, or we go to budget forums to hear the mayor discuss, you know, how they're going to diversify the budget for education and so forth. Many, many, many times, the people that are present are those who have the resources, the access, the knowledge, the means to be present. And a lot of times it drowns the voice of those who really want to be present, who need the change the most. Those here in DC, east of the river, where most of the children come from, but are impoverished or underrepresented or do not have access to the, the means and the, and the actual qualitative resources that are necessary to help to make them a well-rounded individual and have a quality education. So therefore, a lot of times we go to forums and we have to always show our purple wave, which you see mm -hmm. me wearing. So like we have to always have our pave swag on. We always have to campaign and, and engage our parents and say, please, you know, join virtually, join this way, join that way, just so that you can be represented. Because a lot of times the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And unfortunately, the squeaky wheel sometimes isn't those who need it the most. They're the ones that have the most resources and access. Mm -hmm. And it's very unfair and unjust because then it affects the children who are going to have to um, deal with the outcomes of those uh, situations. Thank you so much. And, and um, Kamaya, as a student, what impact do you see when students, families, and communities' voices are front and center in education? Having um, families and communities come together to voice their opinions, it makes a big difference, um, knowing that families are actually wanting to make change um, that they sometimes families don't even know that they can do things but then when they come together and they realize oh I actually do have a voice it matters you know talking to administration um, having the communities there with them administration normally takes accountability into 
what students and parents are saying. If we have enough people to come in, because if it's just one, nine times out of 10, administration will likely bypass it, but having multiple families and communities come together and talk to um, administration, it makes such a difference, especially in my hometown. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So next question. We're seeing a lot, as I mentioned earlier, around calls for shifts in curriculum that are both constraining and restrictive to students, right? It's doing a lot of curtailing of student learning. So this question really is, what do you see as the political dynamic behind the recent calls for parents' rights in schools aimed at restricting curriculum and student learning. So I'm gonna go to Morgan first and say to you, from your perspective as a national organization, could you share the lay of the land in terms of these restrictions that you see going on? Sure, and there are so many that I made a list. I know, right? So Wait, <laughs> scroll. Yes, um, it, it's actually really disturbing. So um, as you all know, these types of policies are passing in states across the country and communities across the country really built on language that started as an executive order issued by President Trump. Um, and so what is really disturbing is that what started in one way, and this wasn't a new thing, you know, you all um, fully understand that there are all sorts of attacks on education, on equitable education, on children of color, on children with disabilities, on LGBTQ youth. This is just the most current iteration of those attacks, um, and a really, you know, co sort of comprehensive one. So in 2020, we really saw um, states starting to adopt these so-called anti-CRT laws, anti-critical race theory laws, um, which were really um, aimed at restricting conversations, truthful conversations about history, the history of race, um, and other forms of discrimination in this country, um, sort of clipping the through lines of that history to what we are seeing currently, what students are experiencing currently in their everyday lives in terms of systemic inequities. And they really attacked a lot of other really critical pieces of, of young people's education, like their ability um, to engage in extracurricular activities, the ability of teachers to be able to receive training on um, important topics related to equity and discrimination and how their students are experiencing it. And so we saw those laws really start, and I, I live in Texas, and so um, ours, actually several, um, passed in early 2020. And then we saw those laws being used to defend other practices that were not actually part of the law at all. Um, and so we saw in communities across the state and across the country, um, censorship of books um, in school libraries, lists being developed of books that um, people felt children shouldn't be uh, exposed to in their libraries and classrooms. One fun one in Texas, for example, was um, a parent tried to challenge the biography of Michelle Obama, our, one of our first ladies, because she said that white girls that read Michelle Obama's story might feel bad about themselves. Um, and so it was, it, they might, I don't know, but, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> right, and so then we saw, so, so we saw really these laws being used to defend a lot of really horrible um, practices being used to propose withholding funds from schools if they had any of the materials in their classrooms, which is really horrible, especially given that we, especially since we know that schools are already underfunded, particularly um, for students of color. Um, the idea of controlling sort of woke philosophies in schools was used to defend practices like um, uh, not talking about the experiences of LGBTQ plus communities, of restricting participation of LGBTQ plus youth in um, extracurricular activities like sports. Um, we see now states going after academic freedom in colleges and institutions of higher education by eliminating tenure and saying that if you teach critical race theory um, in institutions of higher education, that is evidence that you should have your tenure removed. Um, we see states scrubbing terms like equity, um, diversity from their state materials. So in Virginia, we didn't see a law passed, but what we saw was an executive order issued by Governor Glenn Youngkin that said that the state education agency, and it did do this, had to go through all of its materials, remove materials that had certain words like equity and diversity, um, remove data collection tools, remove a lot of tools that have been put in place to address inequities in schools, and really lean into this framing that if we talk about race, that in and of itself is racist. And so we're seeing um, this push to really question fundamental civil rights principles and say like, we can't discuss this. 
we can't address differences in achievement based on race because that, would, that in and of itself is a violation of other students' civil rights. Um, see, my list is long. I'm just gonna wrap it, because I know I'm gonna wrap it up. They're, they're obviously going after social emotional learning. That's something that, they, that the architects of all of these policies have said um, is being used to spread so-called woke philosophies. And of course, we have the spreading of these um, so-called parental rights bills, which as we know are really targeted at the, the rights and voices of certain parents and not others who have traditionally been left out of conversations in schools. Thank you. I actually live in Loudoun County, Virginia, so I know all that happened on My day grandmother one. My grandmother was a teacher in Loudoun Scare County. Scare us all, yes. yes. So Kamaya, as a student, are you seeing the effects of what's just been shared, from what Morgan shared with us? Are you seeing that in your education? Um, actually, most definitely. Um, knowing, well, being a college student, I see that they are taking away some of history. Um, and by being a minority, it's like, why can I not learn about my history if I'm getting this education? And knowing that, it, it makes me feel some type of way um, mm -hmm. because, I mean, it's, it's American history as well, so it's not like it's random information, but I feel like it's ways that, um, it's ways that things should be handled, and I feel like this was handled in a very different way. Um, the, I feel my mic went completely blank trying so sorry. That's okay, that's okay. Thank you, no, you're fine. So the next question, in, in part of the attacks that are going forward, we see a lot of calls for there to be parents' rights. Right, parent rights, we want a bill of rights for parents. Parents should be able to do things like get books removed, take things off shelves, and the kinds of learning that we just talked about. But the question I have, I remember being a parent and signing a whole packet of papers that allowed me to remove my child from lessons. Uh, my child could not be photographed if I did not want them to be. That's part of what parents' rights are already about. So my question is, what kind of parents' rights are now under attack? So I'm gonna to go to you, Michael, first, and ask you, as a parent, what kind of rights do you see being either added to what you already have or taken away from you that you think you should have? <clears throat> yeah, so I think that um, the bottom line of all of this, right, is that it's really forcing you as a parent to now educate your child in all of these things that the school should have been doing uh, and was doing. Uh, and frankly, um, the teachers are clearly more equipped to discuss equity, CRT, and all these other things than uh, a typical parent is. And I think the, the, when, when we talk about parents' rights, I think um, where um, the, 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 the push and pull is the more rights and flexibility you give to your parents, the more stress it puts on teachers. And where I would want the teacher to be spending all of their time preparing lesson plans um, I have, you know, my kindergarten teachers telling me that they have to make sure their lessons don't include language like identity, even though it's really important to help a kindergartner understand what it is to have an identity, right? And so for me, you know, the Parents' Rights Campaign uh, puts an additional burden on parents who were confident that their kids were getting a full education uh, to now um, uh, either A, advocate alongside parents who want to ban books and ban language and uh, do these things. And so either advocate an opposite of opposition of them uh, or instruct your own child. And I think both of those uh, are a very tough task for parents who already found it very hard to be engaged. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, to me, I think that that's the challenge that we have to face now with the new sort of parents' rights campaign uh, it's part of why I'm running for school board and why we're trying to get more people to run for school board because uh, there has to be uh, an end to this. Otherwise, um, the education will look very different, you know, five, ten years from now. That's right. Thank you. And Letitia, from your perspective from uh, DC PAVE, could you share some examples of parents utilizing their power to support students? Absolutely. So as a part of PAVE, we've been active in the city. Uh, for now since 2017. I started with PAVE in 2018 
And since we have constantly gone to the Wilson Building where our council members sit, who are responsible for making the decision as it relates to our, our budget and how funding is allocated, whether it be for specific programming or out of school time funding or transparency in the budget to help parents to better understand what is happening in the education system and to better be able to advocate for their children. Every parent wants their children to be better than them or do better than them so that we can have a better world, right? So every parent also wants to be involved and engaged in the education. And so as a group of parents, we advocate and amplify our voices by doing various um, tactics throughout the school year to either raise funding for specific issues, whether it be mental health services, whether it be the budget transparency, whether it be out of school time funding. And what we do is we, we go to the people who have the decision making power. We as stakeholders um, stand on our feet flat footed and let them know like we are the ones, we are your constituents, we are your residents, we are the ones who are going to be enduring whatever decisions you make. We're the, the effect of your cause and so therefore you need to listen to us. And we do that through advocacy and various factors, whether it be through Twitter and calling the council members out or calling the mayor out, whether it be at uh, Voice and Choice Week, which we have every year in January, where we meet with each council member and we're able to discuss our issues, our initiatives, tell our stories and let them understand what their decisions and how, are, how their decisions impact the people that they serve and, and remind them that they are serving us and not the other way around. And then also we have times where we have budget forums. We actually hosted our own budget forum recently where we invited council members and um, state of board education members to come and hear our voices and understand our, our call. Like this is an election year for us. So everybody needs to know what it is that we need them to be doing once they get into office and we're gonna hold them accountable. And that's the other part of our advocacy is we like, you know, once you're here, you get this money, now we're gonna hold you to the fire because we need you to do these things. We didn't ask for the funding for it to be reallocated to other places or for it to be sitting in banks and, and, and trusts and things like that, but it to be utilized to better our children. Again, the purpose of everything we do at PAVE is to amplify our voices for our students because not all parents like me can sit here and do this work. You know, they have to go to work. And as he mentioned, like we can't necessarily um, take out time and do homeschooling or teach them or reinforce what the teacher is doing. So we rely heavily upon the school system to give us a solid foundation for our children to be well-rounded, well-informed, to make great decisions and be critical thinkers. And so what we do as parents is create Bill of Rights like we do have um, and have um, put into, um, into fruition a couple years back in I believe 2019 or 2020 where we went and canvassed all of DC parents and asked them what is important to them and asked them what they need to see as parents to be involved in the education system and how we change and how we move forward. And so uh, as a DC uh, PAVE member, board member, as well as citywide member, we represent the parents of the city to transform education for the better. Thank you so much. So thinking about the various types of efforts that are going forth, those on the side where there's constraint and restriction, but then those on the side where there are deep efforts towards more inclusion, right? So how do those efforts really impact the families who are most at the margins? Open that up. How is it really affecting those parents? They're seeing all these forces for the yes, for no, take it away, put it on the shelf. How do they begin to really kick some tires and get under the hoods and make sense of all this if I'm a parent, like you said, Letitia, I'm at work, I don't know. So how is this affecting those parents most at the margins? Uh, Michael, why don't you start us off? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, what we've seen certainly early on is that, I mean, they're, not, they're just not there, right? And so they, the, the effect is their children um, uh, definitely sort of either get marginalized and or sort of just adjust to this new system. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the, the challenges with that is, um, you know, by the time the parents would become engaged and by the time they realize, hey, this is different, um, it's gonna be, you know, w well down the road. 
Um, and so, you know, I, I don't have a great answer as to um, how those uh, parents sort of make changes, um, but I will say that um, the effect on the students is real and it's happening very quickly. Um, uh, and it, it's really from K through 12, right? So it, it's not just any specific segment. Uh, and um, where I think that oftentimes we sort of relied on the school to uh, sort of, you know, gradually introduce subjects, those things are just not happening. Yeah, and so come on, I'm gonna ask you to come back and how do you see this affecting students? Like you're, you talked earlier about, you know, you're feeling a sense of lacking of information. But when you see in the news and you see across the country all of this conversation with parents worrying about who should read what and who should learn what, as a student, talk to us about how that's really affecting you. Um, it is affecting me through, I guess like mental health is one thing, um, because it's not just for me but other minorities as well, knowing that our history once again is being, I guess, like lessened. Um, we can't really talk about certain things. We can't really do certain things. Um, and having parents in our corner, they're kind of our support system during this time. Like they don't know um, how to do certain things. So then they try to ask for, you know, what can they do, where to go, how to talk to people about these things to help us out a little more in which they are upset as well. So talking to administration, um, it's not really much that they can say to us to help, but mental health is definitely something that impacts um, different students. It's not just me, but so. Yeah, thank you. As we think about messaging, because we hear stories, stories and what we're going through are all about messaging, the narration, right? The through line of what's actually happening versus what we think is happening. So I want you all to consider what is the breakthrough messaging for combating these false narratives about parents' rights. And Morgan, I'm gonna have you start us off. I think there are a couple of important elements um, for the messaging. Um, one, talking about all families um, and who they are and who um, often does not feel connected to a school community. So families of color, immigrant families, and really painting the picture of like all of these families should be part of the conversation. So we're not focused on, on certain families, the loudest families, the families with the most access, but who are all these families and what do they look like um, and what do they want and what are those shared common things that everyone wants um, for young people. I think that's an important part of the messaging. And then I think the second thing I'll add is just that even though there are difficulties for some parents to be able to engage with the school, it is a school's responsibility to, to build community in an authentic way. Um, we shouldn't put all of the responsibility on each individual parent to figure out how to work around um, a job schedule or figure out how to um, get themselves to, to uh, the school building for uh, a pre-scheduled meeting. It's the school's responsibility to figure out what is going on in a particular community, the needs of that particular community, and how they build systems of outreach and authentic engagement to reach every single family in that community. Very, very helpful. Michael, what are your thoughts on that? <clears throat> um, well, on that last piece, I think that that is a wonderful goal, but I think that the system is working as intended. I think that I think, um, said so. <laughs> I think that uh, certainly uh, in, in our areas, I think the administration uh, absolutely understands uh, who the voices are that they want to reach uh, and want to provide access to, and, and they are doing it um, exactly as they'd like. Um, and um, I think that one of the, the challenges of trying to recenter the conversation is that parents don't have the understanding of CRT to begin with. And so you have parents on the one side that are saying things that are obviously not CRT. Um, you know, we've had uh, discussions with parents who don't want our kindergartners to be learning about equity or identity or diversity. And a lot of these things are just sort of basic things that you need to understand to be a human being, to identify with your neighbor. Uh, and so it becomes very hard to then engage with them on a level that says, hey, listen, 
I am focused on my kindergartner and your kindergartner learning to read. It does not matter um, what we are learning to read here because there is no kindergarten book that is going to indoctrinate your child that is in public school today. And that logic makes sense, but when you sort of put it against the folks who have been watching Fox News and who have, um, in my particular area, you know, school board members that are also telling them other things, um, you get a population of people, and I've had this conversation, who ask me, do you feel more comfortable with your teacher teaching your child about equity and diversity, or, uh, uh, or, or would you rather teach them at home? And I said, clearly, with my teacher. They have gone to school, they have master's degrees, they do seminars, there's a number of things that make them more competent and capable uh, than me. At the same time, if they are not allowed to do that, then I am looking at your child and I'm looking at you and I know exactly what your child will be learning. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the challenge, I think, um, uh, for, for, for us uh, in engaging and messaging uh, is really trying to figure out, A, what it is that they believe initially because even though we say it's one thing, it's really something that is far, far, far worse and I would say um, um, uh, a little bit more insidious. But then once you understand that, bringing them back to the base of what school is about and importantly also what they're doing is providing a real undue burden on teachers and administrative staff uh, and, you know, causing teacher shortages and all these other things. And so um, as far as the messaging goes, again, I don't have a perfect answer, but I know that there are just so many things that, um, that are being affected by this that I think people really need to know and understand. Thank you so much. I wanna push uh, a little further on two more things. Number one, the idea of power. Because the language of power, I wanna use my power as, my, as a parent, I wanna advocate. So we're, we're hearing language around power on both sides. And then connect that to what you learned yesterday when we had the plenary on messaging to the media. How do we use power as a parent advocate to begin to push against these forces that we see? Letitia, I'm gonna leave that question and ask you to please start us off. So power um, generally has a negative connotation attached to it. It's, it's a force. It's a it's someone who's trying to exert something beyond the norm. And what we've learned and through PAVE and through our fellowships and through our engagement and our advocacy is that power also has a very empowering meaning too. And it's a very positive thing. We all have the power to make decisions every single day. And as a parent advocate, we have the power to make sure our voices are heard. And that's why PAVE is PAVE parents amplifying their voices because they do have power. Like if there are no parents, there are no students, there is no system. And so therefore they need to be able to raise their voices and utilize that power that they do have, whether it be through text, whether it be through email, whether it be through surveys, whether it be through campaigns, whether it be through like some of the tactics in the slideshow, uh, they can be able to, whether it be in a, a, a parent organization meeting, whether it be in a board meeting, whether it be in an open forum for budget hearings, whether it be at the mayor's office, wherever there's an open door, wherever there's an email address, wherever there's a phone number, they can use their power to make sure that they are heard. Testifying is an amazing, powerful tool that we use every single day and every time there's an opportunity within PAVE to be able to make sure that our, our people in power who are decision makers, that they know that this is our story, this is how we feel, and if you don't do something, this is how we will react or this is how we will respond. And a lot of that comes through election. A lot of that comes through uh, the, 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 us holding the people of power in accountability. Um, and so power can be looked at in a very a very minute way where you are just voicing your opinion to your leadership at school, but then it can go much further where you go to your, your leadership within your, your state or your city and your board of education and those who have decision-making power to say, no, 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 like you promised this and I'm gonna hold you accountable for this. And so you use your power to be able to make sure that change happens and it happens the way that it should happen and making sure that you're at the table at every opportunity and that you are even um, aware of what's happening. 
even recently we had a meeting with Learn24, which is uh, a part of our OST, our Out of School Time Funding, um, and they are responsible. And we did a campaign where we literally had everybody email. It was a advocacy and action day where every parent who received the tweet or the email or the text, they literally sent a pre-written letter to the person in charge to say, look, this is what you need to do, this is what we need to do. And in that, <laughs> and I'm laughing because it's funny to me that in this meeting we had where she was talking about strategy and the strategic plan for the upcoming years and the, and the citywide assessment for what OST should look like for our students in the city, 28 people were on the call. We have thousands of residents. 28 people were on the call and she was so disconnected that she asked, well, why am I getting all these letters and tweets and calls? I don't understand. Well, maybe because you're disconnected. She's like, is there a disconnect, you think? Well, um, there's 28 people on the call that is a very big misrepresentation of the city. So we use our power by whatever means necessary to be able to let people know like, hey, what you're doing is not enough. And we deserve more and our children deserve more and we won't stop until you do something about it. Fantastic, thank you so much. That's gonna uh, close out this portion of our panel and we're gonna open the floor up now for some questions. So if you have a question, please right here, see Jeannie's hand up in the back. So someone please grab a microphone for her. Thank you, everybody. Uh, great panel, very proud of Kamaya, our Tennessee student. Yay. Thank you, Kamaya. So a couple of things. One, Tennessee has passed a number, well, proposed uh, a number of heinous bills in this category. Some were stopped, uh, several passed, including one yesterday uh, that creates a statewide library commission where they can decide what books are in every single library in Tennessee. Um, and, and if a parent complains about a book, the book is pulled for every library in Tennessee. I mean, yesterday that happened. So this is real. But at the okay. same time, a bill was passed and moved through and, 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 and voted on a bipartisan nature to require black history be taught in every school. So both things can be true at once, right? You, so I think what we have to do, this is Jeannie talking, we have to move to action. And action requires proposing legislation, finding model legislation. That's what the other side's doing. Every one of these bills is the same. <laughs> the bill in, in Louisiana is the same as the bill in Tennessee is the same as the bill in Texas. Why aren't we proposing model legislation at the same time and finding allies to, to move those bills? I mean, that's what it's gonna take, right? Um, and then, so my question really for this group is, I think about the organization that Kaya Henderson has formed Reconstruction, where they are, they have created really, really powerful curriculum lessons for communities, for families, for to teach black history in their own communities. What do we think about this third rail of, um, you know, do we say, um, is this an abdication of like we're giving up on trying to make it happen in schools? Or are we building upon what should be happening in schools? Um, I, I want to say I'm in full support of the program. I think it's an interesting way, an important way to make sure children learn. Um, but does that distract from the work that, that these folks are trying to do in schools every day? I'm just curious how we are able to do both. I wonder if people had comments about that. If I may, um, one a dual question. So you're, you're asking the question about curriculum and who learns what. And so you have layers of what curriculum is gonna be anyway. Your sort of bought curriculum, your taught curriculum, your hidden curriculum, your under the table, like all the curricula, right? Mm -hmm. And so there is a both and to it. And so what Kaya Henderson's group is doing is offering what's always been done. So black people in this country have always stolen opportunities to educate themselves. And so that's part of what you're seeing um, with what she's doing, but she's not. She's now putting what's been under the table on top of the table and forcing a type of conversation that um, is asking people to do what you're asking. Is this the way? 
So that's part on the curriculum side. So on the advocacy side, my partners up here will be able to answer that level of the conversation. Anyone? I mean, I'll just really quickly say, you know, I don't mind it, but I don't love it. Part of the issue with only teaching black history to black people uh, is that, uh, and particularly making it sort of an elective thing or something that is targeting um, 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 us is that there is a tremendous element of um, empathy that you, you miss out on uh, when you don't have sort of this universal knowledge and understanding of it. And I think that keeping it in public schools and giving it to everyone uh, really is, is an important element that we have to continue to fight for. So I, I, I am certainly not against it, but at the same time, I do think that um, we need to make sure that um, there is a significant amount of black history and just American history taught in school uh, the way it actually happened. And shout out to Delaware, um, because they actually, students in Delaware uh, advocated and now there is a bill in, a Delo in the whole state of Delaware that it must, that black history is part of the curriculum for the entire state. So shout out to Delaware on that. I just wanna piggyback off of him and say like, I agree and disagree because coming from a historically black college, um, I had to learn certain things. It was imperative that I understood my race, my background, what our struggles were. Although I do agree everyone should learn that because that is American history as she had mentioned and as he has mentioned, and I think that it is integral for every person to understand if you're an American and you're going to American schools, understand the, the uprising of America, like how did it started and how do we get there. I always think back to Sankofa. You have to know where you're coming from to know where you're going. And I never valued history until I had a history teacher who happened to look like me explain to me, this is why you need to know. Like, how are you gonna make decisions? How are you gonna move forward? What are you gonna teach your children? What are you gonna make, do for your career? And how are you gonna um, proceed and perform in that way if you don't understand who you really are? That's who I am, as she mentioned. Like, that's my history. It's American history from the very beginning. It's my ancestors' history. And so therefore, everybody should know about it. Just like I have to learn about Caucasian history or uh, other countries' histories or the Holocaust or anything else. So I think it definitely helps you become a well-rounded individual and well-informed to make critical thinking and to be uh, able to have a varied perspective and to be able to um, not be racist in, in the sense of the word. But I also, I, I, I love Kaya Henderson's initiative and I wish that my children can go to it. And again, it's one of those things where access is, is limited because it, it, it does cost, <laughs> you know, and I appreciate it and I really would love to be a part of it because I want my kids to know that history and they're not gonna get that from their school. And so there are schools like Historically Black Colleges and there are programs like Kaya Henderson's that goes the extra mile to make sure that people who are interested, whether you're black or white, Chinese, Asian or whatever, can learn that information and gather it for themselves to be a better person and have a better perspective and not be racist, not be prejudiced, and not have biases that always stand in the way of how we move forward in life and how we interact with one another. Another question? Yes, right here. We're, we've been trying to get people to do just culturally responsive pedagogy. How about that? So we're not even doing contra, culturally responsive pedagogy, so this CRT um, piece definitely is not happening in schools. And so yesterday when we were talking about messaging, like how do we keep saying that is not CRT? Um, and for those of us who have an understanding of CRT, you know you're not teaching that in kindergarten. Like, for real, you're not. So like, I just think like when we're talking about deliberate messaging, like we have to say that. And I think it's a, oh, a time too to say like, we've been for decades talking about cultural responsive pedagogy, let's teaching, let's, let's get there. Um, and the other piece I wanted to make a comment on is I hear people say that our parents aren't involved and uh, um, how do we engage our parents? And I think about my parents. My parents were very involved in my education, but it did not look like them coming up to my school. Right. That's right. And so like, how do we get people to understand, like being involved in my education meant like 
making sure they could provide for us. Being involved in my education meant like me being in extracurricular activities, it meant like checking my homework, it meant us eating dinner together, um, or some things we found out about that we went to for free on the weekends. And so a parent not being at a school does not mean a parent is not engaged in their child's education. So, absolutely, thank you. We were talking about that earlier, that if, uh, I said I was like smart on Mondays through Fridays and then like Thursdays or Saturdays, it's kind of a crapshoot. And like some days, you just don't show up differently. And so I think if we go back to what Jeannie talked about and think about it in terms of messaging and counter narration, right? Building the counter narration to that. So Morgan, what would, your, what would your thoughts be regarding what she just talked about in terms of the messaging and putting out the statement of what does parental engagement look like if we put an equitable lens on it, right? So if we talk about equitable parent engagement and parent advocacy, what does that look like? So I'll have you talk about it, Mike, you talk about it, Leticia, you talk about it, and then uh, Kamaya would love for you to talk about what would it look like for you to see it that way, go ahead. I appreciate that comment so much. Um, and if I could just share for a second about the model that IDRA has developed over the past couple of decades that was really built um, with families in the lower Rio Grande Valley in Texas. Um, a lot of immigrant families, a lot of Spanish-speaking families um, who just felt like they did not have a place in the traditional PTA model in their school. And so what we found from working with them was that it was really building community with them um, and supporting local community building efforts however we could that were outside of the school context to start with. So making sure that there were relationships, it, it turned out to mostly be women, among the women in the organizations that they had an understanding of like the school system and the way it worked and where the levers of power were, but that they identified the issues that were important for um, their own children and that they in identified an education focused project for their own children and sometimes that did not look like showing up, up at the school often it didn't it was within community and what could they do to support students in their community that being said I think it's really important for people to understand how to engage in schools and like I said earlier for schools to, to make every effort to reach out in every way to um, all parents in the community to make sure they understand the many ways that they can engage um, in sort of the policy and practice of the school. So I, I, I think it is both. I think it is building community around children, supporting them um, when that's outside of the school context, but also making sure that there are opportunities for people to engage in a really authentic way um, within the structure of the school where their, their kids spend so much of the day. So I'm gonna just push back on what you said. Like, a, I think you're right, but B, um, showing up makes a material difference in the outcome of what we can achieve. And I'll just give you a personal narrative example. So um, I had an issue with uh, CRT and a school board member and I committed to just showing up. I committed to just going to every school board meeting from that moment on and I started going to school board meetings. And sure enough, after the third school board meeting, me being the only one there, uh, I met um, almost all the school board trustees. And then after that, um, they asked me if I wanted to be on the special education uh, committee uh, to uh, figure out, um, because my oldest daughter's special needs, um, they asked me to, to, to help them sort of improve our special ed program. And then because I kept showing up, they asked me, um, we have this bond commission that uh, we're gonna do a, almost probably a billion dollar bond in Plano uh, that will basically fund our entire school system for the next four years. Uh, they asked me if I wanted to be on that commission. And I, I when I always said yes. And, and when I get to that particular commission, uh, it's a room of 75 individuals in the community. None of them look like us. It's mostly white men, uh, all from a position of significant privilege. Um, and they are the ones that are now making decisions very specifically on what schools stay open, what schools get more resources, how we design the schools, how we put money into different programs, um, and you don't have a voice if, if you're just at home. And so as much as I wanna agree with your statement, 
I think the challenge is if you're not present, then there are so many opportunities that you will miss out on. And your voice, while um, as powerful as it could be, just won't be heard. Uh, and so the influence that we can have, uh, it starts with showing up. And not everybody has the time to show up. My parents worked, my dad worked three jobs, my mom worked two, uh, and they couldn't show up. But the, the challenge is when you can show up, just show up. Um, because ultimately, I, I think it, 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 it really does matter. It makes a big, big difference. It's a good point of balance, right? Letitia? As a parent advocate and as a child whose parent could not be involved in the way that is described in terms of showing up, showing up has so many meanings and so many ways of doing so. And such that, yes, my mom maybe have helped me with homework on occasions when she wasn't tired of getting ready for the next job. Or maybe I had my brothers or my, or my siblings or cousins or someone else to support me. But my mom didn't get to go to parent-teacher conferences. My mom didn't get to be engaged in my school life because I was bused 45 minutes away. Mm -hmm. Even to just get up in the morning to go to school, like it was like I had to be up before she was even up. And I had to be bused and I had to, you know, go to sock hops back and forth from downtown Indianapolis, Indiana, all the way out to Franklin Township, 45 minutes to an hour away. And so my parent couldn't show up. So therefore, I am now showing up for my kids. Yes, I am privileged to have the opportunity and the, the resources and the access to be able to show up at my kids' school. I drop off and pick up every day. And I, before COVID, I was able to talk to all the teachers and build relationships. Yes, I've been on PTA or KPO boards since they were in pre-K three. But PK, um, the KPO or KIPP parent organization or T PTA or PTOs as you know them, most of it is fundraising. It wasn't about changing the curriculum. It wasn't about making sure the parents' voices were heard. It wasn't about improving the standards and opportunities that children that attended that school. The layout of every school and every system is different. Even within our um, KIPP charter school organization, every um, school leader has the autonomy to do what they want. And that's a plus and a minus, because then therefore, where is the standard? What does every child have the opportunity to be engaged in and be involved in, or what resources do they have? What languages are they learning? What programming is available? What arts and music are they investing into these children? And so as a parent and as an advocate, showing up to me means so many things. And being a part of the recruitment for parent-teacher organizations and being a part of PAVE, I know showing up for some parents is not going to be physically in a building. It's not going to be at um, the Wilson Building campaigning or picketing or signing letters or doing testimonies and waiting all day to be heard. I had to literally wait over eight hours the last time I testified about the progression of the school education in DC. And I literally was at the car, I was at work, I was doing all these things like, is it my turn, is it my turn, is it my turn? Just trying to make sure that they heard my story and they knew that what we wanted is something valuable and beneficial, not just for me as a parent or an individual, but for all the parents and, and all the students and all of the children that are being affected by these changes and decisions. Showing up to me is Twitter feeds. Showing up to me is writing letters. Showing up to me is calling in testifying. Showing up to me is being there for your children before and after school, asking them about whatever's happening in school. Showing up to me is texting the teacher, calling the teacher. When my teacher, when my student, my son said to me, I think my teacher is bullying me. Hold on, wait a minute, time out. What do you mean? I can't talk to the teachers anymore because I can't come into the building. But they, Mm, excuse me, but believe me, I'm going to show up for my children in whatever way possible. Rather, I gotta go call my paid parents and say, hey, look, show up with me in front of this door. When they come out, I need to talk to our principals, our school leaders, our superintendents, our deputy of mayors, et cetera, et cetera. Or it's me saying, look, I will not be ignored. My child matters. This is money right here, and I know that matters to you, if nothing else. You will work for these dollars. You will provide a qualitative education and experience for my child. Showing up to me as a parent is so much more than being in a building. And it's so much more than being able to testify because not everybody has the ability to get up and speak. Not everybody feels like they're capable. Not everybody has the means or access or tools or resources to do that. Showing up is being there for your child or for children in whatever capacity you can. 
whether that's being a part of a group or an organization, whether that's part of, of, of a campaign. Just being a signature is showing up, making sure your voice is heard and making sure people know that you're gonna hold them accountable and you, ma you matter, your voice matters, your children matter, the future matters, and that's our children. All right, thank you so much. Well, I'm gonna do one last word. One word. One word. Y'all got one word? Okay. Parent advocacy is. You start, Kamaya. One word. I'm sorry, I was thinking. Um, support. All right. Letitia, one word. Change. Michael? Uh, vital. And Morgan? Inclusive. And to that, we thank you. Yeah. <laughs>